Hey guys, my name is Celeste and welcome back to my YouTube channel. In today's video, I will be talking about how to judge righteously. So I posted a poll on my Instagram asking, are our senses alone, what we see and what we hear, reliable sources when making a judgment? 19% said yes and 81% said no. And I 100% agree with the 81%. So let's take a look into the Bible to learn how we are to properly judge. I post every James 4.15, meaning whenever the Lord wills. So definitely make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you get notified whenever the Lord puts a video idea on my heart for me to share with you. So if you want to follow along, you can turn your Bibles to the book of John 7. But I'm going to start by reading Romans 12 too. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So let's really break this verse down. This scripture is saying, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed. So we need to go through a transformation. And what is that transformation? It says transformed by the renewing of your mind which I find is interesting. They're kind of opposites. It's saying instead of having a pattern like the world, have a renewed mind. And it says once our minds are renewed, then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Our minds need to change to the point where we have a biblical thought process. The world usually judges people by their outward appearance. And a good example of that is cancel culture. So many people will make judgments on a person and decide they hate them when they've never even met them. It, that judgment is made solely based on what they've seen from that person, what they've heard about that person. And we as believers need to get rid of that worldly thought process. We need to be transformed, renewing our minds, and have a thought process that seeks God. Our goal should be to know his will, his mind, his opinion in the matter. So now I'm going to turn my Bible to John 7 verse 20. So Jesus did a miracle on the Sabbath. And to give you a quick background of what the Sabbath is, it is a day of rest. In the old law, it was written to honor the Sabbath, to keep the Sabbath holy. But because Jesus performed a miracle on the Sabbath, this is what they said to him, starting from verse 20. You are demon possessed, the crowd answered. Who was trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all amazed. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So right there, in this scripture, Jesus answers the question of the poll I put up. Should we solely rely on our senses? Absolutely not. Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances. And you can take note of the word mere. It means only. It's saying don't just judge by appearances. Sometimes our appearances do come in handy when it comes to making judgments. For example, I can be inside, look out my window and see that it's raining and come to the conclusion, make a judgment saying, you know what? I should get an umbrella. I should get a raincoat. So in the scripture, it's saying don't just judge by appearances, what you're seeing, but instead judge correctly. And so what we're going to break down today is what it means to judge correctly. Now, I really want to start this conversation by really pointing out what's going on here. The crowd is mad at Jesus because he healed someone's whole body on the day that God said to keep holy. Now, God strictly instructed people not to work on the Sabbath. And so in their minds, with their own understanding, they're thinking this man is working on the Sabbath, the day that's meant to be kept holy. This man is obviously not from God. But Jesus made a really good point. And what he was telling these people was, well, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Because something that was also a part of the law was that when a baby was born, that he needed to be circumcised during a certain period of time. And I also want you to notice that they called Jesus demon-possessed. When they were making this judgment about Jesus, saying that he was demon-possessed, because he healed someone on the Sabbath, they were judging with their own understanding. In their minds, it was wrong of Jesus to do this because of the law which said to keep the Sabbath holy. And instead of these people actually going to Jesus and seeking understanding of why he did what he did on the day that's meant to be kept holy, they were quick to judge him solely by appearance and call him demon possessed. So this is an example right here of Jesus being judged unrighteously. And now I'm going to turn to John 8, 15. This is Jesus speaking. He said, you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. 
But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. So the first thing that Jesus says here in verse 15 is that you judge by human standards. That right there tells us that is the wrong way to judge because these people were judging Jesus unrighteously and he addressed the issue in their judgment. The reason why their judgment was wrong is because they were judging by human standards. They were conforming to the pattern of the world, the way the world judges, the way that humans judge, instead of transforming their minds and seeking the mind of God in the matter. And then Jesus says, I pass judgment on no one. Now that right there is something that I really want to point out. Jesus did not judge people. Sometimes it is best for us to not judge at all than to make a judgment on a person. But Jesus does tell us the right way to judge because he says, But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. And right there is the key to judging properly. If we want to judge someone, if we want to come to a decision about this person, we should not come to this decision alone. Jesus himself just told us that he does not judge alone. He is not alone and neither are we. When we are saved, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and he makes his home in us, in our hearts. So if we have God's spirit living within us, there should be no reason as to why we want to make judgments alone when we have contact to the Father and we can actually seek his mind, his opinion, in the matter. So I'm going to keep reading. He says, because I am not alone, I stand with the father who sent me. We should have that same thought process when we're making a judgment. We should want what God wants. We should agree with what God has to say. So our first thought as believers, when wanting to make a judgment about a situation or a person, our thought should be, God, what do you have to say about this? We should stand with the Father. And so in verse 17, Jesus says, in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. Because in the story, they were telling Jesus that his testimony wasn't true because he's his only witness. But it's funny because it's not a part of the law. The law does not say that you need to have two witnesses in order for a testimony to be true. But the Pharisees, the people who are talking to Jesus, In their own law, which they came up in their own mind with their own human standards, they came to the conclusion that a testimony is only true with two witnesses. And again, that is an unrighteous way to judge when you judge by human standards according to your own law instead of the law, instead of what God has to say. So this is yet another example of Jesus being judged unrighteously. And I love how Jesus responded in verse 18 when he says, I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. And I'm going to quickly read Matthew 7, 2. And it says, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. So that right there is why judging righteously is so important. Because with the same measure we judge others, we will be judged in that way. So now I'm going to turn my Bible to John 8, verse 48. It says, The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, now we know that you are demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. This is yet another example of Jesus being called demon possessed. Isn't it so interesting that the one man who is sinless is being called demon possessed? The very son of God. But I do want to break down their thought process in their defense. Jesus said, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Of course the Jews are going to be a little confused and they're like, what do you mean? Abraham died. The prophets died. But take note of these words. After Jesus said, whoever obeys my word will never see death. They said, now we know that you are demon possessed. The issue that a lot of these people have is they're drawing conclusions, making judgments without seeking the mind of God. But they're making these judgments too confidently. Because they're saying things like, oh, we know that this man's possessed by a demon. 
but they didn't know because little did they know that they're actually wrong. They're making decisions and drawing conclusions unrighteously, all because they lack understanding. And that's their issue. They don't humble themselves to seek understanding as to explain to me what it is you're saying. Their hearts were hardened and they wanted to just jump to their own conclusions rather than having an open heart, one that's willing to seek understanding and really wants to know the mind of God in the matter, really wants to get to the bottom of this and seek understanding of the truth. So now we're gonna go to John 9 verse 24. So a little background of this story, Jesus healed a man who was born blind. This man was born blind. Everyone knew that this man was blind and all of a sudden he could see after Jesus healed him. So now the Pharisees are like, okay, what's up with this man? Let's get to the bottom of what's going on here. So the Pharisees went to this man who was born blind and they're trying to get information about Jesus. So in verse 24, it says, a second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Again, with these words, we know. It shows such a, a cockiness because they're so confidently wrong by judging and leaning on their own understanding. Instead of trying to seek understanding of the truth, they're just saying, oh no, we know this man is definitely a sinner. Which is so funny because Jesus was the one person in this world who actually never sinned. Then the man who was born blind replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then after this, they were upset that he had said that and they ended up insulting him. But another thing I really wanna point out is the fact that they're trying to get information from the man who was blind. And the man who was blind said to them, I have told you already and you did not listen. These people aren't listening. They're not seeking understanding. They don't care enough to seek Jesus. They could have went to Jesus and asked, okay, explain to us, how did you do this? How did you heal this man who was born blind? So now I want to turn to verse 39. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. I love this scripture. These people, the Pharisees, were spiritually blind. You needed spiritual understanding to understand why Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. There needed to be spiritual understanding to understand how Jesus healed this man who was born blind. You need to have spiritual understanding to understand what Jesus meant when he said, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Jesus was a spiritual man and his words needed to be spiritually discerned. So these people are blind. And if you're blind, technically you would be guilty of sin. But it's because now you claim you can see that your guilt remains. And we see them claim these things so confidently by saying, we know this man is a sinner. We know he's demon possessed. So as believers, how are we to properly judge we need spiritual discernment. So I'm gonna turn my Bible to 2 Corinthians 12, seven. It says, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the spirit, a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. And at the end of this chapter, in the very last verse, 31, it says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. The Holy Spirit distributes these spiritual gifts to each of us as he pleases but he loves when we eagerly desire these gifts. Go to the Holy Spirit and say, please give me the gift of spiritual discernment. This is a very important gift. And in this verse, that spiritual gift is known as distinguishing between spirits. 
It is so important for us as believers to know the spirit behind the person. God said that man looks at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart. And if he judges people by looking at their heart, we need to make sure we're judging in that same way. Because again, like the verse I mentioned, to the same measure we judge others, we will be judged. I'm gonna give you an example of judging unrighteously. Say it's really late and I'm driving around at night and I have to go to the bathroom so bad and most places are closed. And the only place that's open is the liquor store. And so I walk into the liquor store to see if they have a bathroom so I could use it. But say that the second God sees me enter the liquor store, he turns his head and jumps to the conclusion that I'm a drunkard. I'm going there to get wasted. I'm going there to run away from my problems. And so he's like, oh, nope, she's a drunkard. She's committing drunkenness. And she lacks self-control because obviously she can't handle whatever she's going through. So she's obviously turning to alcohol. When truth be told, I'm really just going to use the bathroom. That is what we do when we judge others based on what we see. And the idea of God judging me in that way is so scary. Imagine if he didn't look at the intention of my heart, but only looked at what I did on the outside. I'm going to turn my Bible to Acts 16 from verse 16. It says, Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money from her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. Imagine if you saw this play out before your very eyes. If you see this person who's saying something that doesn't sound bad, she's saying, oh look, these men are telling you the way in which to be saved. Her words sound good, there doesn't seem to be a problem, but he knew the spirit behind the person speaking those things which is what led him to say in the name of Jesus, leave this woman. But imagine if you saw Paul say that to that woman, you'd probably be like, what? She didn't do anything wrong. What do you mean in the name of Jesus leave? Like what? You're weird. Like, you even probably think like that's weird. In 1 Corinthians 2 14, it says the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. When we had the Holy Spirit within us, yes, we're going to make judgments about things. We're going to need to discern the spirit behind the person who's talking to us. We're going to need to seek the mind of God in the matter to know, Lord, what do you have to say about me going to this place? What do you have to say about me hanging out with this person? But the judgments of the person with the spirit aren't subject to merely human judgments. And the person without the spirit is going to consider these things foolish. I'm going to read Matthew 7 from verse 15. And it says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They're clothed on the outside. You can see my clothes, but you can't see my heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. So it doesn't really matter how this person is clothed. And obviously they're not talking about actual clothing, but they're talking about how they portray themselves on the outside. Maybe you'll see someone who seems super bubbly and they may talk and say, oh God is so good, oh, oh amen, oh preach it. But it's about the heart of the person, not the words of the person, not how they look on the outside, not what you see them necessarily doing on the outside. It's not about the action, it's about the root where this action is coming from. Are they genuine in what they're doing? So it says, watch out for false prophets because they come to you in the clothing of sheep, but inwardly, it's on the inside that they're ferocious wolves. And that right there should be enough of a reason to not judge by the outward appearance. Because in the same way that this person can adorn themselves on the outside to look like a sheep, there may be a believer who to you in your eyes may look like a wolf because you think, oh my goodness, maybe they're dressing immodestly on the outside. Your definition of immodest because different people are convicted differently. Or maybe you see someone on the outside doing something that isn't technically sin in the Bible, but you yourself personally are convicted of it. But in their hearts, they have a heart that is after God. It goes both ways. It's all about the heart, not about what's on the outside of this person. In verse 16, it says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes 
or figs from thistles, you can recognize if someone is another believer by the fruits you see in their life. But again, I want to make clear the difference of knowing someone by their fruits and judging them by their outward appearance. So you can turn your Bible with me to Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruits of the Spirit, and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Most of these fruits, as you'll notice, aren't necessarily fruits that can be outwardly perceived. For example, on the outside, you can see someone smiling, but it doesn't mean that they're not depressed in their heart. Someone could pretend to be kind to you on the outside, but on the inside, they could have evil intention. And that is why spiritual discernment is so important. Now, in order for there to be spiritual discernment, again, you need to pray for these spiritual gifts. But another thing that's going to come into play is faith. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you watch my last video, which talks about how to increase your faith. Because here's the truth about discernment. Your human reasoning will often contradict what God may be telling you. It takes faith to follow God. But we need to learn to get rid of our human reasoning, our human way of thinking, and have faith in the Father, even if we don't fully understand what it is he's telling us. And a good example of this is, I'll give an example of something that happened in my life. Recently, there was this YouTuber I was watching and they adore themselves on the outside as a believer. There's nothing that they say in particular to make you think that this person wouldn't be a follower of Christ. But my spirit, something did not feel right. Every time I watched their videos, I actually left feeling drained and feeling farther away from God. And so I asked the father his opinion in the matter and he told me that this person was not one of his. When hearing that from God, I have to take it by faith. Even even if it contradicts my own human reasoning. Because for me, with my understanding, I say, they say they're a Christian, they look like a Christian, they seem like a Christian, but I need to seek the mind of God to know the heart of the person. Because what matters isn't on the outside. When we die, our physical bodies pass away and return to dust, but it's our heart, our spirit that lives on. And that's why it's the important part about us. That is why faith is so important as a believer. Scripture says that we will not receive anything we ask of God if we ask with doubt. So it is so important to have faith behind your asking when you're asking him for spiritual discernment and when you are asking him what he has to say about the matter. If I went to God saying, Lord, what do you have to say about this person? And I hear this person is not one of mine. And I say, eh, that wasn't you, God. If I have that response every time I ask the Father something, what do you think will happen? Eventually, he'll probably stop responding to me. He'll probably stop answering because it's kind of offensive to go to God and ask him a question and then always lack having faith in his ability to give you an answer. So that is why it is so important to grow in faith because in order to have these spiritual gifts such as discernment, we need to walk by faith. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I really pray that this was helpful. This topic is so important because we want God to judge us by looking at our hearts and we should do the same with others. And obviously we as individuals can't see the heart of a person, which is why we are so blessed to be able to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and have the spiritual gift of discernment. So I hope this encourages you. Next time you see something that you wanna make a judgment about, do not be quick to judge. Don't be quick to jump to a conclusion, but rather seek understanding by seeking the mind of God in the matter. I love you guys, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!